The Delphi murder trial is approaching, highly anticipated, another compelling trial on the way. I'm here with a little bit of preview. My name's Rich Schoenstein. Welcome to True Crime MTN. We're over 50,000 subscribers, but if you haven't, subscribe away and like this video. Do it right now before you even hear what I have to say. Then you won't be able to take it back. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this Delphi murder case. I am not as steeped in it as some other people. I want to say that right up front. I'm giving you sort of a reaction as I begin to download more of the information here. This is set for a trial in October. I'm getting ready for it a little bit and getting a sense of the case. And the case is in court right now this week for three days of pre-trial hearings to iron out all kinds of things. There's a motion about uh, what jail cell the defendant should be in. There are motions about what evidence should come in. There's even a motion to dismiss the case, although I don't see that happening. Now, if you don't know the case, this is a grisly case involving the murder of two girls, Liberty Libby German, 14 years old at the time, Abigail Abby Williams, 13 years old at the time. The suspect, the defendant, is Richard Matthew Allen, 51 years old. Uh, these two girls were killed on February 13, 2017, near the Monhan, Monon High Bridge in Delphi, Indiana. Basically, they were on a hiking trail, and they were found near the hiking trail stabbed to death, um, and, and there's been some talk of the extent of the mutilation. I don't know that for sure, but that'll probably come out at trial. So July 30, 31st, and August 1st, there are pretrial hearings before Special Judge Francis Gull to cover a variety of things that the parties have to say in advance of the trial. And on the first day of those hearings, the first thing that came up is where Richard Allen should be housed. He has been in a maximum security prison, but it's very far from the trial. And his two defense lawyers say it's too far for them to have to travel just to prep with him for trial. They want him in jail in Cass County, which is much closer. It's an easier trip for lawyers. They say the sheriff is willing to have him there. And my sense is that the judge will probably leave him there in advance of trial so he can be closer and his lawyers can have access. That seems to make sense to me, and it doesn't seem all that opposed by the prosecution. Up next was a motion to compel and or for sanctions. And this case has had a lot of back and forth already about the production of documents by the prosecution. The defense has complained about not getting things. And yesterday they were mostly complaining about getting things late or getting things in a disorganized data dump. Uh, apparently they got 26 terabytes of data, which is a lot of data. I mean, you data people out there will know what I'm talking about, but I can tell you when we receive discovery on a case, if you get a terabyte, it's a lot of data. So this is 26 data, terabytes of data, and the defense says it was completely unorganized. They didn't have an index. They don't know what's what. The, the, the prosecution countered that, says they've really been spoon feeding the material to the defense as best they can. The material was provided in electronic folders. It's as organized as it could be. So I'm sure the judge is going to try to get the parties to work that out. And I would be, I'm doubtful that there would be any sanctions of significance like keeping evidence out or anything like that. The third thing that was heard yesterday was a motion to dismiss based on an alleged failure to uh, investigate and preserve evidence relating to somebody that the defense has identified as a possible alternative suspect, a guy named Brad Holder. Uh, they cite a failure to extract his phone data or to preserve video. The defense says that the prosecution did 101 phone extractions, but somehow failed to get Brad Holder's phone. The prosecution says Brad Holder has an alibi. He was at work at the time the murders occurred and later at a gym 
and therefore he had been completely ruled out of having anything to do with the murders. I gather the theory is that he knew one of the kids, maybe through one of his kids. Um, the short the short answer here is there's no way this case is getting dismissed at this stage. So the motion to dismiss isn't going to happen. Whether or not that evidence can be addressed by the defense at trial remains to be seen. So today, Wednesday, there are motions relating to the admissibility of various alleged confessions of the defendant, Richard Allen. Supposedly, he said things to his wife and his mother over the prison phone. And the argument is he doesn't have spousal immunity if he was talking to her on a phone line he knew was being recorded. There's statements to a psychologist in prison, statements to a fellow inmate. And I think the defense is arguing that those are not trustworthy. Uh, there's a reliability issue, they say, because the defendant has been under a lot of pressure and concern in prison. Also, the statement to the inmate apparently referenced molestation, but there's no physical evidence of molestation of either of the victims. So there's a question about the reliability of those statements. There's also an outstanding issue with respect to a statement pre-arrest um, and whether or not the defendant was properly Mirandized. So those motions are all going to work their way through. But obviously, the question of whether this defendant confessed or said highly incriminating things to law enforcement, to a fellow inmate, to a prison psychologist, to his wife, to his mother, I mean, that is very important evidence in the case that the prosecution wants in, the defense wants out. Lastly, I think there's some motion practice relating to the defense's efforts to put on a third party culprit defense that somebody else committed these crimes. In addition to the Brad Holder guy I mentioned, the defense has a theory that these murders were committed by Odinists uh, as some sort of pagan ritual. And they point to the way the bodies were left with leaves and twigs arranged in a certain way that they say is a sign of Odinism. And the prosecution opposes efforts to bring any references to Odinism, occult, ritualistic killings, any kind of third party uh, culprit defense into the case. And there are issues about other things as well, what the defense can say about the way the case has been handled, the way his discovery has proceeded. All of this has to be worked out by the court. Nothing out of the ordinary about that. This kind of motion in limine, pretrial motions. I mean, this is the work that happens before a trial, especially a trial of this magnitude. Okay. Key evidence for the uh, prosecution. There is a bullet, a 40 round unfired that was found close to the victims that apparently, according to the prosecution, matches a firearm that was found in Richard Allen's home. Now, they weren't killed by gunshot, but the theory is that he had a gun with them and used that to force them down the hill, in the words of the perpetrator, where he did kill them. Um, and so that bullet matching his gun obviously would be incredible evidence. Supposedly, there's some cat hair on the victims that may match Alan's cat. There's also a video slash audio of somebody. You can't really tell for sure that it's Richard Allen, but the prosecution says it is approaching the girls. It was shot on one of the girls' cell phones, uh, and you can hear him saying, down the hill, ominously. And then, of course, there are those multiple confessions we've discussed. Those would be key evidence if they get in. The defense case, I'm not 100% sure what it's going to be right now. I think they're leaving their options open. They're, they're workshopping this third-party culprit stuff. I don't know about that. I think that might be a mistake. I mean, we've talked about in other cases when the defense points to a third party culprit, they're taking on a burden of proof that they don't necessarily need to take on. And the Odinist stuff, to me, sounds pretty out there. Like they would need some really good evidence of that. And I haven't heard of it yet. As a theory, it seems a little bit 
it, it seems a little bit daffy to tell you the truth. Odinus in the middle of the woods did this to two girls. I don't know about that. Trial this case is set for October 15th through November 15th. Um, I'm going to be following it. We're going to bring you more as the pretrial proceedings progress and these motions get sorted out. And then, of course, we'll be watching the trial closely as we watch all of these uh, amazing true crime trials right here on True Crime MTN. I'm Rich Schoenstein. Thanks again for watching. We are adjourned. If you like this video, please like it and subscribe. I'm Dave Ehrenberg, a.k.a. the Florida Lawman, here on the fastest growing true crime channel, True Crime MTN. And we'll see you next time.